Shalom, this is Reverend John Ferret, and this is Lesson 40 in the podcast series, The Gospel According to Moses in the Book of Genesis. So this is the Torah series for Christians. And there's an interesting verse that we're actually going to be focusing in on in the New Testament that talks about Lot. So I'm in 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'll be reading verses 7 through 9. And if he, meaning God, rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous in their punishment for the day of judgment. Lot is righteous? And we say, wait a minute. Uh, we just got done with Lesson 39. It doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, he's part of the culture. He's now a city official because we saw him sitting in the gate. On top of that, what happens? He offers... He offers his own daughters to the mob. I mean, righteous? Come on. Now, there's a Jewish tradition among the Orthodox rabbis that Lot was righteous, but where he lacked was in his character. His character was not at the high level of Abraham. So, perhaps Peter in writing 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, is only expressing, you might say, the current view and opinions of his day. Remember, God did not write the Bible. The Bible is written by inspired writers, like Peter in this case. He's under God's inspiration. So perhaps he's inspired to say, wait a minute, the way we feel about Lot today is that he was a righteous man. But maybe there's something to this. Dismissing the rabbinical statement that, yes, indeed, Lot was a righteous man, a God-fearer, and so on. The Torah does not indicate that. However, Lot is a lot like us. We would say, we Christians, we're saved by grace. However, we're still sinners. There is the potential of sin. Just because you're saved by grace does not mean that the inclination to sin that's in all human beings doesn't mean that we would come and fall again to sin. We are potential sinners. Now, perhaps this story of Lot is related to this. I'm in Romans chapter 5, reading verses 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And so I'm just saying, okay, God demonstrates his own love towards Lot, towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, obviously, Christ did not die in the Old Testament. But we do know this, that in John 3, 16, God, I mean, it, it, John is writing, God so loved the world, even Lot, even Pharaoh. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So, this is interesting. Lot was saved from God's wrath. He comes from a righteous family. His uncle is Abraham. But even righteous, just like, but even Lot, being a righteous man, is still obviously a potential sinner and perhaps even assimilated into the culture and maybe didn't sin, per se. Sitting in the gate is not a sin. Actively participating in the culture is not a sin unless you're, you know, worshiping their gods and actually going against, obviously, God's law. He was safe from God's wrath. We're safe from God's wrath. Huh. You know, it seems like it's time to go and study. So ready? 
Ready to go into Lesson 40? Come. Let's go. Now, when we go to 2 Peter chapter 2, 9 through 10, I'm going to uh, reference a great Torah teacher who I admire greatly. His name is Tim Haig. And Tim Haig, let's see if I have the information here, um, is the founder of Torah, Resource, of Torah Resources. TorahResource.com. He's a Christian. And what I have here is his Torah commentary. And uh, I bumped into this. So let me read it to you. It's in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Because I know one of you, and maybe those of you that are sitting on the audio, if you find my email or my phone number, you probably want to give me a call and say, what about this? So in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, we read, And if he rescued righteous Lot... So this is Paul. No, this is Peter writing. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among, the, among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous for, under punishment from the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Now this is fascinating, because Peter said, righteous Lot was saved. Tim Haig, okay, says this, we're taken aback by Peter's description of Lot. I mean, look what he did with his daughters. I mean, this is disgusting. He is described as righteous Lot and has it having a righteous soul. The sages, meaning the rabbis, okay, Note that Lot was even more righteous than his wife. But how was Lot considered righteous himself? It hardly seems possible considering his actions. What we must conclude, okay, this is his opinion, okay, this is his conclusion, based upon this verse in 2 Peter. What we must conclude is that Lot knew the righteous ways of the Lord. And he accepted the way of God himself. In other words, he knew what was right, and he longed for righteousness within his own soul. But we must also conclude that Lot was trapped by his own circumstances. We know he assimilated into the culture. But we knew he did righteous actions. And so we have this conflict, and I think this is what Haig is coming to. He had allowed his life to become entrenched in the surroundings, the surroundings of wickedness. For Lot to have picked up and left would have meant the loss of most of his wealth. Ah, now things are beginning to make sense. His flocks and herds were too numerous to be sustained anywhere else than the lust pastures of Sodom. The wealth of this world had, anch the wealth of this world had anchored him to the filth of Sodom. This is seen in his reluctance to leave. Remember what I said. Why didn't he leave? And I told you, he's a rich man. Very wealthy. Him and Abraham were very wealthy. The choice before him was to leave and preserve his life, and in so doing lose all of his wealth, or to stay. Had the angels not pulled him out, and they did pull him out. Read it. You go to uh, Genesis 9, they yanked him out of there. He was delaying. He didn't want to leave. They had to yank him out, and they had to set him outside the city. It appears that he would have stayed wealth and blinded spiritual eyes of righteous Lot. In the life of Lot, then, we are taught a very important lesson. And this is what I appreciate about this teacher, Tim Haig, as I do with other some key teachers like Dennis Prager and others. How does he relate to us? This is a Torah lesson. This is a lesson for us today. Decisions we make for economic reasons but which neglect the more important issues of the soul are destined for disaster. This is an important issue for our times. The affluence of our modern world can be the enemy's trap. We must set our longings and affections on things above, 
not on things in this world. Our priorities must be spiritually appraised. But Peter's point is that God will never lose those he chooses for righteousness. God will never lose them. God rescues Lot, even from the consequences of his poor decisions. Granted, Lot loses everything except some members of his family. But righteous Lot is spared. I love his comments with regards to 2 Peter. Awesome thoughts. So the righteousness of Lot, he had the lure and appeal of the evil, the wickedness, the pleasures, and the, of the pleasures and the riches. Imagine also how it may have affected those Hebrews coming out of Egypt. What were they coming out of? Now they're in bondage, right? They were in slavery, but they had food. They had three squares a day. They had a house. They were not in the wilderness where there were snakes and scorpions and no water. Following some god they couldn't even see. At least in Egypt, they saw the gods. They had statues of the gods. So they assimilated and Egypt was burned into them. And I always like to say that indeed Egypt is burned into us as well. Okay, going on in 19, I'm now at, I'm going to start in verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sidom and Amora, brimstone and fire from the Lord. Just as, as a note, you guys, I said Sidom and Amora. You have Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the English words that are used. But the actual Hebrew is Sidom and Amora. There's no G or G in there. It's Sidom and Amora. So he rained, the, uh, rained uh, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his, now listen to this phrase because this is important. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So she did look back and she's behind Lot. Now, one of the things I have learned from this radio host that today we know as Dennis Prager. And he's got a lot of insight and a lot of wisdom. But um, one of the things he taught me is when you're reading anything, whether it's the Bible, whether it's an article in the newspaper, whatever, whatever you're reading, you have to ask yourself the question, why did they use that word? Okay. Why did they use that word? Why didn't they use another word? So we have this phrase in 26 again, but his wife looked back from behind him. Why did they have to put that there? That's important. God has inspired Moses to actually put that statement there. Well, she's following Lot, following her husband, but she probably was possibly drawn back to her past because her husband was walking forward. Remember what the angel said to Lot and his wife and his daughters? Don't look back. You look to the front. Look forward. Don't look back. So she sees Lot going off into some nebulous future, but she's behind her husband and Lot can't see what she's doing because he, she is behind him. Now, it, did she turn back because she wanted to see the fire and brimstone and the destruction of the city? I would have. It's really cool, man. I'd like to see the destruction. That would have been awesome, all right? But that's me, okay? Or... Was she so shaken that she was possibly, notice I'm underlining the word possibly now, that she's possibly drawn to her past. See, the thing is, the Torah doesn't say why she turned back. No, nothing there. So the thing is, is that this is commentary, opinions of scholars who are looking at this situation and said, this is one possibility. One possibility is she wanted to see the destruction. Another possibility is she was drawn back to her past. She was drawn back to her home. She was drawn back to her security. Where is it? It's back there. That's her life. You know, it's possible that she had four daughters. I know people say, well, you had two daughters. It's possible that she had four. Remember the son-in-laws? They were married. 
Now we have two possibilities. So let me just take this off. I just thought that this is just interesting. Because of the culture. I want you to see the culture. Okay? The son-in-law said we're not going, and they said they were married. Okay, that either means one of two things. Either they were married and they, con con uh, they consummated the marriage, which means the daughters knew men. Okay? Because there were two daughters who did not know men. You remember that? So it could be that, I'm just saying, could, this could be. The Torah doesn't say, but it could be the son-in-laws were married to two of four daughters, two of four, whereby they said, and our wives are not going with us. Or, in the culture, when you're engaged in the ancient Near East, okay, and even though you have not cons consummated the marriage, in Jesus' day, it could be months and months and months before that happened, you were considered married even though you did not consummate the marriage. And so, therefore, when Mary is perhaps accused of all of a sudden being with child, she was engaged to Joseph. No, she wasn't. She was married. Now, it doesn't say that. It does say engaged, betrothed. Yes, that's clear. But that status in the ancient Near East, Jesus' day and past, means that they were married legally. You needed to have a divorce. So it could be that there were just two daughters. And they did not know men yet, and they went with their father. So you see the possibilities? You could have four daughters or two. I just find that interesting. It's got nothing to do with the story, okay? Because we just concentrate on the two daughters, okay? Which were probably the two daughters of the son-in-laws, and they said, we're not staying here. We're going to go with our dad. Maybe that's what it is. I just find it interesting. That's the culture. So the, she's looking at her past. And this is from Dr. John Creed in his Genesis commentary. In here, I don't want to go through all of that reading. So he, she's looking back. She's looking at the past, what has happened, what is known, where her security is. But what's the future? The future is with Adonai, which is unknown. And like Paul said, we're looking through a warped glass, a glass darkly. Now, I didn't know where Dennis Prager was going to go with this. So I'll just share with you. It was Dennis Prager in his Torah uh, lessons uh, that he taught for 35 years. He's finally done. He's finally writing it and putting it in books right now where he suggested that this is a real possibility. And it is. It really is a possibility. Because we don't know. The Torah does not say why she turned back. But for him, he went off on this, and it really affected me deeply. Because I'm 70 years old. And some of you realize that I just began this Torah study. We're in the second term. We're on Genesis 19. And you realize I want to go all the way through Deuteronomy 34. You say, whoa, okay. Um, and so for me, may I live that long to get there and my voice hold out. But Dennis Prager went down this route. She said, he said to me, again, Dennis's comment, I just love it. I thought I'd share his opinion with you. He says to me, when I look at this, he said, many of us have lots of, Wife syndrome. Lot's wife syndrome. And that is, when you get older, you start saying, I'm too old. My time has passed. It's now for the young to take over. We're too old to change. I find that interesting to me because all of this in my life, the Jewish roots of my faith, understanding the Torah, coming back to our Hebrew heritage, archaeology, history, geography, etc. My goodness, it was age 60 when I left teaching at Meadow Creek Christian High School and said, I'm going to go into full-time ministry. You know how scary that was? I can't change. Whew. Do you have lots wife, lots <coughs> wife syndrome? Hold on to memories and the good times of long past. This is death. He said, we as believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each and every one of us, no matter what age, are called to live, not die. We're called to go. Abraham, how old was we, he when God says go? 75. Go. And what does he do? Boom. He leaves. Going into the unknown. 
Genesis 15, 6. And I return to this now because we started a while back in trying to figure out what's Abraham, why would, did God pick Abraham? One of the things that we know about Abraham is in Genesis 15, 6, he trusted the Lord. And we dealt with that a couple of lessons back when we were in Genesis 15, 6. It doesn't say he believed in God, okay? Now, your Bible says that, but I'm trying to tell you in Hebrew, it doesn't say that. We've kind of dealt with that. He trusted in the Lord. In other words, whatever God said, he trusted it and relied on what God was going to say. And he knew it was going to be help, helpful. And the picture, the Hebrew picture, one of the best ways of looking at it is, when you actually study the Hebrew picture and the conceptual meaning, the pictorial meaning of the word there, it's as if Abraham is looking at God who carries him, like a mother carries a child. And Abraham relied on God, trusted in the one who carries him. May it be that we are like Avram. And no matter where we're in our life, we don't give up. Memories are great. I've got great memories. I've got great memories of camping and grandchildren and all sorts of, you know, Christmas parties and birthday parties and all sorts of stuff, and they're great. But I'm looking forward to the future, looking forward to going on. Now, in verse 29, after we leave Lot's wife, okay, we come to another interesting phrase, Genesis 19, 29, and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and set Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. God remembered Abraham. To me, you guys, that has been such a readover statement. God remembered his covenant with Israel. God remembered his covenant with David. What did he forget? And I remember I was challenged on that. Does God forget? What does it mean he remembered? Well, our scholars that have actually tried to translate the Hebrew Bible have done their best and they've come to the word remembered. The thing is, God doesn't remember. Not like you. You're human. He's not. He's beyond. He's supernatural. So, can you see this? Okay, an angel. He comes to God. Okay. Um, Lord, just as a for you, FYI for you, I just wanted to let you know that the fire and brimstone right now are being poured out about Sodom and Gomorrah. I just wanted to let you know that. Okay, and I don't know what God was doing, but the angel interrupts God. And God says, are you kidding? Now? Oh, no, I forgot. I wanted to save Lot. I forgot all about Abraham. Darn, is Lot still alive? So, so what's going on here? Does God forget? Now, the Hebrew word there is H2142, Zakor. And again, here we go with the lesson that I keep on stressing. We, American Christians, are Greek thinkers. We look at a word and we say Hebrew's got to have a definition because that's what we deal with. And we're very logical. That's great. That's a gift from God. But the thing is, Hebrew is conceptual. It's pictorial. It's action-based. Okay? So when we take a look at Gesenius... And we take a look at the nuances of this word, this idea, the picture. It's to remember, to recollect, but it can mean this, to bear something in mind. To bear something in, you know what that means? To carry something in your mind. That's what zakor means. It can mean remember. And I've heard Christians come to me, zakor means remember. No, it doesn't. It can mean remember, but it also can mean to bear something in mind. So in other words, it's there constantly. Or another way of looking at it, to keep in remembrance constantly. To keep, we humans can't do that. That is human-based, we cannot do it. We can bear something in mind all the time, but again, we have to somehow do something to ourselves to try to bring, to, to bring it back to mind. Okay? The awareness that is ever constant is God. He never has to remember his covenant with the Hebrews because it's always there. 
It's part of him. It's part of the relationship. He never forgets it. It's the best way God can influence Moses to give you an idea from a human point of view of what's going on. God never forgot. But at that moment, okay, God saved Lot, all right? Why? Because he has an ever constant remembrance of his promise to Abraham, and Abraham is a righteous man. Ever constant, always bearing it in mind. Again, like for a human point, we can't do it. God can. Just think about that. He can never forget you. He is always constantly bearing you in mind. That I can't grasp that. I can't fully get my hands around this. But this is God. But see, we want to put him in a box. God remembered. What did he forget? How could he forget? But see, again, when we get into the Hebrew, that's why this language is so fantastic. Okay? When you go into, like Gesenius, Hebrew, Greek, uh, a Greek, uh, the Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, and you go in there, you want to get into the conceptual meaning, the pictorial meaning of the word. Lot was saved since Abraham was righteous, and he was constantly in God's mind. You are constantly in God's mind. I'm constantly in God's mind. And I go to the Father and say, why? Why would you constantly want to remember me? Me? Are you kidding? Remember Billy Graham. And God says, well, he's with me. I don't have to even remember him anymore, okay? I don't even forget him. He's with me right now. But we are constantly in God's mind. Now, this event, to me, brings us, this event in Torah, brings us all the way to Yeshua. It blew me away when I was sitting there. And again, I pray constantly that God inspires me and opens my eyes to see things. And then I read this. Every one of us in this room should be named Lot. There's not one of you, including me, that has now somehow integrated ourselves into this evil, ungodly culture that's around us. Not one of us. We're all sinners. Every one of us. We're lots. We're like that. So then when we go to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, listen to this. I think Paul was thinking about these events when he wrote this. For while we were still helpless, Lot, at the right time, before the fire and brimstone comes down, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, while we were like Lot, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. This is the story of Lot. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. When I see that Lot was saved because God was constantly aware of Abraham and the righteousness of Abraham. And this was Abraham's nephew. All of a sudden, I see the Father and I see Jesus. And I see us. I see the gospel according to Moses. Amazing. Yeshua's sacrifice, his death, the blood of the Lamb, constantly in God's mind. Jesus is constantly in God's mind when he was here. Constantly remembered. All we can say is Baruch Haba. B'Shem Adonai. So once again, we see that to truly understand events in the Bible, in many cases, we need to know the geography of Israel. Lot's daughters, they're in the valley of the Dead Sea. And to me, being in the Dead Sea Valley, as I've mentioned in the lesson, it's, e it's easily to understand why they thought there were no men left. On the west, they're surrounded by the high cliffs of the Judean wilderness. On the east, the high mountains of the country of Jordan today. If you know the area, you'd understand. It just makes sense, but we don't. 
It wasn't written to us. It was written to them, probably the Hebrews coming out of Egypt over 3,000 years ago. But the lesson God is teaching was clear then. And it's clear now. God is in control. And even for the Hebrews who were coming out of Egypt, it was being reinforced over and over and over again that out of chaos and out of disaster, out of evil, comes hope and good news. We call good news the gospel. Because the firstborn daughter had an incestual relationship with her, with her dad, Lot, and out of that comes the Moabites. And who's from Moab? Out of this terrible relationship, who is an ancestor of Lot and his firstborn daughter out of this ancestral relationship? Ruth, a pagan woman, not a Hebrew. But we know the story of Ruth and she becomes a God-fearer. She marries Boaz. And Boaz is the great-grandfather of David. Ruth is counted in the genealogy of Messiah Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Wow. Yes, again, God brings order out of chaos. That was the message then and the message for us now. Praise be the Lord. Praise be Adonai. Well, we're going into lesson 41, and once again, Abraham and Sarah lie. They're going to be facing the Philistine king, Abimelech, in your Bible, in English, Abimelech. And again, Abraham is thinking, oh my goodness, uh, they don't fear God here. They're going to take her. But if I'm her brother, then yeah, they'll take her, but they won't kill me. Now we have to ask this. Sarah is 90 at this time. And Abimelech, the king, he can have any young woman that he wants. So why Sarah? Now, first of all, was Sarah beautiful? Yes, that's in Genesis chapter 12. That's the only place in Genesis chapter 12 where it talks about the fact that Sarah was very beautiful. She was 65 years old. Now you can figure all of this out. Go to Genesis 17, 17, and it just so happens that uh, Abraham is 100, and this is at the birth of Isaac. Sarah is 90 years old, and this is again about the time when they're going to be encountering Abimelech. It's not, it's, it's not that far later. So she's 90 years old. This is 25 years later. Now listen, uh, in our day and age, uh, we see that there are women who not only were they beautiful when they were 20 and 30 and 40, but it carries into their 50s and 60s. But now, we've seen it in our own lives. A woman can change dramatically from 65 to 90. Now, the rabbis teach what they would call a baba maisa. That's Yiddish. And a Baba Misa basically is an old wives' tale. And their old wives' tale is, they basically are saying in their Baba Misa is, God restored Sarah's beauty and her body. Huh? The Bible does not say that. No. Now that's a Midrash. Now remember, the definition of a Midrash is that the rabbis cannot explain something or there's something very puzzling in the Torah and so they do a midrash, and sometimes they make up a solution, and sometimes their solution is a little bit difficult to handle. I was involved in messianic congregations, and that's all we studied. We'd come to a mess, uh, an orthodox rabbinic midrash, and we would accept it as truth. I, I just can't do that anymore. And it's disturbing to me that so many Messianic Gentiles are not bringing their brain to the Bible. What does the Torah say? We cannot accept rabbinic midrash as truth. The Bible does not say that God restored Sarah's beauty, and it doesn't even say that she's beautiful at this time. Abraham's the one that's worried. So indeed, it's a sad commentary on our Bible knowledge 
and the maturity of our approach to God's word. We have to ask ourselves, what does the Bible say? If we take the Bible, put it into historical context, what's real? What makes sense? So indeed, let's go see. So I will see you in Lesson 41. And until then, Shalom. Shalom.